Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Finnish Institute of International Affairs webinar. Today, we are going to discuss Turkey EU relations and uh, Turkey's political process, the domestic process, um, looking at the current scenery in Turkey and also evaluating and giving expectations before the 2023 uh, parliamentary and presidential elections to be held in Turkey. Um, and also the 2023 will be the centennial year of the Republic of Turkey. Um, Turkey EU relations based on accession talks have been in a, in a dead end over a decade. During this time span, Turkey has become a competitive authoritarian state. And unfortunately, now we're near of fulfilling the official membership criteria. One can in increasingly hear arguments that a new framework is urgently needed in this situation. On the other hand, very little is being done in practice until this day. At the same time, Turkey is approaching the elections scheduled for June 2023. Um, the EU stance has been based on what is called strategic patience from the EU side mainly. And this has been a policy that aims to look for a post Erdogan era that would allegedly enable a more comparative relationship between Turkey and Europe. Uh, from these uh, assumptions, the idea is now to look at the more in detail the political process. Um, I will now introduce our today's distinguished speakers. Um, first, we have Director Esgur Unhizadjikli. He's a director of the German Marshall Fund office in Ankara, Turkey. Prior to joining the GMF, he was the manager of the Resource Development Department of the Educational Volunteers Foundation of Turkey. He holds master's degree from Koç University in Istanbul. Director Ünlü Hizarcikli is a frequent quest to events and media interviews focusing on Turkish politics, both in Turkey and abroad. He has just recently published a very useful article on today's topic, which you can download from the GMF Ankara website. Then we have Dr. Sinem Adar, who holds a PhD in sociology from the Department of Sociology from Brown University. Dr. Adar is an associate at the Center for Applied Turkish Studies in, uh, at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, SWP, in Berlin. Her research focuses on Turkish domestic politics and EU Turkey relations, with a particular focus on migration, cooperation between EU and Turkey, and the Turkish diasporas in Europe. Dr. Arar has also recently published a very good article on Turkey-EU refugee cooperation and its future prospects. My name is Tony Aranda. I'm a senior research fellow here at the FIA. I mainly concentrate on Turkey's domestic and foreign policy, the Middle East, the Kurdish question, and um, all the relevant issues. Uh, before I give the floor to Özgür Bey, I would like to say that um, this event has been planned before the uh, Russian invasion. And um, of course, these recent events uh, have shocked us all, also here in Finland. And I'm sure that this has had a major impact in, in, in Ankara's side as well. Uh, as much as the time allows, we will try to, to look upon this new situation as well. Uh, but um, first of all, let's try to analyze the today's uh, real topic, Turkey, uh, Turkey's political process and Turkey-EU uh, relations. 
Now, Oscar Bay, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Tony. So I will structure uh, my presentation uh, in three parts. Uh, the first part, I will try to lay out the framework uh, of Turkish elections in, in what kind of an environment uh, they will take place. In the second part, uh, I will talk about uh, what, what kind of outcomes uh, we can or cannot expect. And in the third part, I will talk briefly about uh, what all of this means uh, for Turkey's foreign policy. First of all, I would like to go back to 2015, uh, 2016, when there was a uh, failed coup attempt uh, in Turkey, and then followed uh, by a rule of emergency uh, that suspended uh, many uh, civic rights in Turkey. Back then, there was an argument uh, that emerged, uh, which said uh, that from now on, elections in Turkey would not be real. Uh, President Erdogan uh, would win all the elections. Uh, that would be uh, just, you know, pretenses. Another argument uh, was that while in the future, the elections in Turkey may be uh, unfair uh, and only partially free, they will be real and competitive, and the opposition uh, will have a real chance of winning. So the first opportunity to test uh, these hypotheses uh, was the constitutional referendum uh, in which President Erdogan managed to change the regime in Turkey from parliamentary to presidential. However, it was also followed uh, by, the domestic, uh, by the local elections in which the opposition won in almost every uh, in every metropolitan uh, city in Turkey, with the exception of a few. So the opposition being able to win uh, the local elections, including in Istanbul and Ankara, uh, actually proved the second point, uh, which is that in Turkey elections may be unfair, but they are real and competitive, uh, with the opposition having a real chance of winning. So the next question was. Uh, if the incumbent loses, uh, will he concede? Uh, this was also tested uh, in the local elections because the opposition won in Istanbul. The incumbent, not the incumbent, but the candidate of the governing party uh, did not concede. There was a rerun uh, in which the voters uh, actually punished uh, the candidate of the uh, governing party uh, for forcing a rerun. Uh, so the system in Turkey, uh, even if with a, min with a few uh, minor challenges, uh, actually worked very well. So then, of course, the ne next question is, uh, can election fraud be prevented? As a matter of fact, in Turkey, there is a very strict uh, election law, uh, which provides the opposition, which, which provides full transparency uh, at all stages of voting and uh, vote counting and consolidating, etc. So if there is any, and there can, of course, in any election, uh, there can be uh, a minor fraud uh, that does not have an impact uh, on the result. Uh, but in Turkey's case, the opposition, if they are able to man the ballots, and they are now, uh, can actually prevent large-scale fraud uh, that would have an impact on the outcome. Uh, and of course, if there is actually large-scale fraud, uh, despite these efforts, then it will be reviewed. Uh, it will be impossible uh, to hide this. I am, of course, speaking based on the existing election law. Uh, if there are changes uh, in the Turkish election law uh, that actually limit uh, the level of transparency, then, of course, uh, things could change. Then I would like to move on to the second uh, part of my presentation. Uh, which is, what can we expect from the election? Not long ago, there was a general understanding uh, that President Erdogan could not be defeated in elections. Uh, this was based on the assumption uh, that he was politically too silly for the opposition to win, and the opposition uh, was actually too disorganized, too fragmented, uh, too much without a strategy, so and on. So and on and on, and on, on uh, to win an election. Well, if this, that was the case back then, uh, it is no longer the case. First of all, the opposition is no longer fragmented. Uh, very recently, uh, this Monday, uh, they had a 
joint meeting in Ankara where they signed the memorandum uh, on uh, restoration of the parliamentary system. Uh, so six political parties, all in opposition, came together uh, to sign this ambitious referendum. Uh, they are also strategizing together. They, were, they are very likely uh, to come up with a joint candidate for the presidential election. And to make this kind of election alliance possible, particularly the main opposition party, but also the other parties are doing their best uh, to mitigate polarization, uh, to approach the center, and to make good with identity groups uh, that they have offended in the past. As a matter of fact, leader of the main opposition party went so far as to apologize uh, from all the identity groups, his party, or even you know, different Turkish governments uh, have offended in the past. Now, another important factor is the situation of the Turkish economy, uh, which, of course, on the one hand, we are going, still going through a pandemic. Then there is, of course, uh, a, a, a war uh, not too far away from Turkey's borders. Uh, there, there, there is inflationary pressure at a global scale, uh, but on top of all of this, the Turkish government is experimenting uh, with a very unorthodox economic policy based on the assumption uh, that actually high interest rates cause inflation uh, rather than inflation uh, causing high interest rates. Uh, the independence of the central bank is suspended uh, in practice, and as a result of these factors, uh, Turkey has actually experienced a significant devaluation uh, very recently. Uh, inflation is very high, particularly in food prices, energy prices, uh, that have an impact uh, on the larger society. And then uh, another challenge for President Erdogan is that he is actually losing certain identity groups uh, which he enjoys support from uh, in the past, uh, such as conservative Kurds and the younger population, the younger uh, generation. All of these factors uh, coming together uh, make the election very competitive. And as in any democratic society, and I'm not blaming that Turkey's democracy uh, is without any uh, faults, uh, it's actually uh, Turkey's democracy is increasingly an incomplete democracy, but still a democracy. And as in any democracy, it is not possible uh, to predict the outcome of the election with any certainty, particularly one year before the election. Uh, but I can say uh, that the opposition has the momentum uh, and has at least as much chance as President Erdogan uh, to win the election. Now, the third part of my presentation on Turkish foreign policy. First of all, uh, perhaps, I mean, now we are speaking after uh, the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, I can say uh, with a degree of confidence that what a Western audience would expect from a new government in Turkey is actually being delivered uh, by the current Erdogan administration in Turkey in response uh, to the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. There is, I mean, the general discourse, uh, particularly on social media, is that Turkey is trying to balance uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but this is not true. Turkey is not balancing between Russia and Ukraine. Turkey, under President Erdogan, is supporting Ukraine, is taking a, uh, taking a mainstream NATO position, is supporting Ukraine, and pivoting away from Russia uh, towards its transatlantic allies. Turkey is supporting Ukraine politically, Turkey is supporting Ukraine uh, practically uh, by selling drones. And by the way, Turkey actually yesterday uh, delivered two more drones uh, to Ukraine while the fighting is going on. If Turkey did not want to do this, it could easily say uh, that uh, because it doesn't want to escalate the tension, it's going to withhold the delivery of those drones or could, could have found technical reasons uh, for delaying the delivery, but did not do that. Uh, so uh, Turkey is clearly uh, supporting Ukraine. Uh, in this case, because as a matter of fact, for its own security, uh, Turkey needs to counterbalance uh, against Russia. So if an international audience was expecting a new Turkish government to, for Turkey's rapprochement uh, with the West, it's already happening. And also, by the way, starting with 2020, 
uh, Turkey is also uh, trying to normalize its relations in the region uh, with considerable success in the case of Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. Uh, Israel seems to be uh, in the pipeline. Egypt uh, will take longer. Uh, so, first of all, we perhaps we don't need to uh, wait for a new Turkish government for Turkey's foreign policy uh, to shift significantly. It's already happening. But having said this, if there was a new government in Turkey, what would change? Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that Turkey is no exception to the rule that a country, a country's foreign policy is primarily determined by structural factors, uh, such as perception of national interest, national capacity, changes within the international system, the regional order, etc., etc. And if there is a new Turkish government, these structural factors will continue uh, to shape Turkish foreign policy as they did uh, during the Erdogan administration. So big changes should not be expected from Turkish foreign policy in cases uh, such as Eastern Mediterranean, Cyprus, uh, Syria, etc. Uh, because these are actually based on Turkey's national policies, uh, based on Turkey's national perception of uh, interests and security challenges. But what would indeed change this? The new government would be elected by a very highly diverse uh, set of voters. On the one hand, we would have Islamists, nationalists. On the other hand, we would have social democrats, seculars, and, and there would be center-right voters in between. And in a second round of presidential election, it's very likely that the Kurdish political movement uh, would also support the opposition candidate. So a president elected by such a diverse set of voters and supported in the parliament with an equally diverse set of political parties would actually need to be inclusive uh, as opposed to exclusive and pluralist as opposed to majoritarian. So structurally, uh, Turkey would need to be more democratic. And, and a more democratic Turkey would indirectly uh, help warmer, warmer relations uh, between Turkey and the European Union and Turkey and the United States. Uh, this would actually create uh, a honeymoon phase in Turkey's relations uh, with the West, which would not be endless, uh, but should be used by Turkey and its allies, uh, similarly, uh, to improve the relations. So where Turkey would move on uh, from that point uh, would also be based on uh, the approaches uh, of Turkey's Western allies to Turkey. So if Turkey takes some positive steps in terms of democratization and fulfilling EU conditions on, on certain uh, chapters, let's say, will, this will these positive steps be reciprocated by the EU or will there be nothing else? Uh, the answer to this question uh, will be one of, one of the factors shaping Turkey's policy towards the EU in the future. Or if Turkey is actually showing efforts uh, to resolve some issues such as the S-400 problem, will these efforts be reciprocated by the United States? Or, or will the United States expect the new Turkish government to get rid of the S-400s first, even to start a conversation? Uh, the answer to this question and similar questions will determine uh, the future of uh, U.S.-Turkey relations. And last but not the least, and this is a very important point I have been making for a very long time, uh, Turkish politics should be left to Turkish citizens and only to Turkish citizens. Turkey's allies should stay very clear away from Turkish party politics. And uh, Tony, in the beginning of his remarks, uh, said that strategic patience uh, was one of the aspects of Western approach to Turkey. Uh, this should continue. The Western allies, Turkey's Western allies, should have confidence in the Turkish society to improve Turkish democracy. Uh, let me stop my remarks here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eskul. I think this was very useful to hear uh, regarding the what can be expect from the elections what can be expect from the opposition parties and what uh, are the views 
regarding the possible rapprochement uh, if things go well and, and also how and what's what kind of you uh, what kind of role that you can can play in this uh, I think we proceed the way that I'm not posing any questions at this stage, but we go straight to the next presentation. It's uh, from Dr. Sidem Adar. And then after she has finalized her presentation, uh, I will come up, come up with uh, some of the key issues. And after that, I again give the presentation, uh, the, the current presenters, um, a possibility to respond to those my remarks. And then finally, uh, there is a chance for the for the audience to use the chat function uh, and send me questions, and and then I will formulate them to to our present. Uh, to our to our guests. So, please see them. Go ahead. Thank you, Tony. Uh, also, thank you for the invitation. And hi, Özgür. Nice to uh, see you. <laughs> um, I was asked to talk about the um, Turkish opposition parties, and I'm going to do that. I kind of um, outlined my presentation in three points as well. Um, I'll start with the with kind of discussing how opposition parties in Turkish politics emerged as a as an important challenger to the presidential system because of the presidential system. And then I will move into a, a discussion on the strategy of the Nations Alliance, Millet Ittifakı, the, uh, the alliance that is formed by six of Turkish main opposition parties. And following that, the last part of my um, presentation will look at um, challenges ahead for the Nations Alliance, at least the way I see them in the short term and the mid term. And after uh, this presentation on the opposition parties, I would also kind of share a couple of thoughts about the um, current moment with regards to um, what it means, what it could mean um, for EU-Turkey relations and in general, um, Turkey's um, relations ties with the West. Um, so opposition parties in Turkish politics emerging as a challenger. Now, the presidential system, ironically and perhaps also unintentionally, uh, has contributed to the formation of a quite strong opposition uh, in Turkey. Uh, and I say ironically because the aim of the presidential system was actually in a way consolidate uh, one man's role without significant opposition. So it had actually exactly the opposite effect. Um, and it had exactly the opposite effect, uh, not only because of, but I think primarily because of the alliance politics that it had introduced into the election. And that means the following. Um, any political party or basically in some um, one requires 50 plus one percent of the votes to come into power in the new presidential system as the president. And no political party in Turkey has that kind of power, including the ruling uh, Justice and Development Party. That basically means that any political party who would like its candidate, its candidate to become the president need to get into an alliance with other political parties. And this it, exactly because of this alliance politics, I think there was an important space opened under the presidential system to the opposition parties. And the first um, um, manifestation of this happened, as Özgür mentioned, during the local elections in March 2019, when the opposition um, kind of um, geared, uh, gathered gears together and they managed to win the three biggest metropolitan municipalities, Istanbul, Ankara and Izmir. And of course, this win, I mean, that wasn't, the opposition's alliance uh, was not the only factor behind this win, but it was an important factor. And it certainly, the win certainly boosted the morale of the opposition. So the alliance that came together during the um, local elections in March 2019 uh, by the participation of four parties, the Republican People's Party, EE Party, led by uh, Meral Akşener, Saadet Partisi uh, and Democrat Party, continued 
until today. And with the recent um, addition of Deva and Gelecek parties, splinter parties from the AKP, it basically turned into a kind of like a quite broad, if you would, if you, uh, if you will, um, broad um, um, alliance. Now, what is the strategy of the, and the alliance is called Nations Alliance. What is the strategy of the Nations Alliance? The way I see it, um, first and foremost goal is to appeal to the hesitant voters. Um, against the backdrop of a couple of factors, institutional deterioration um, and economic crisis mainly, the AKP and its junior partner MHP have been in steep decline in the polls uh, since uh, the summer of last year, I would say. However, the voters who are kind of leaving AKP are have been hesitant to kind of find themselves a new home. So the, as it appears, the strategy of the Nations Alliance is to appeal to these hesitant voters. So that's kind of like the hesitant voters, in addition to the HDP, have become one of the important kingmakers in Turkish elections, in the coming elections. And in order to do that, uh, in a way, the Nations Alliance again, the way I see it, has been stressing kind of like the, or has been composed of nationalist and Islamist tones. And it says, this has become even clearer with the, with the participation of the um, Deva and Gelecek parties to the, um, to, the, to the Nations Alliance. And kind of by emphasizing these nationalist Islamist tones, but at the same time centering itself, positioning itself at the center as a way to appeal to the hesitant voters and as a way to kind of positioning itself as the main competitor to the AKP MHP alliance, which at the end of the day is one can think of it as a far right manifestation of a nationalist Islamist uh, bloc. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, the Nations Alliance composed of six parties, and as Özgür mentioned, they um, for the which as an historical um, um, um, a spectacle, one would say, they announced a memorandum of understanding this Monday, actually, which kind of um, um, outlines um, their suggestion or proposal to restore a strengthened version of parliamentary system in Turkey. If they come to power in 2023 elections. Now, this is an historical moment because against all the efforts by Turkey's ruling uh, AKP to divide the opposition, opposition, the four parties initially formed the Nations Alliance, not only managed to stay together, but they were also able to expand the alliance. So in that sense, it is, it is quite of an historical moment. Now, the pact, um, and in a way, um, and um, one would also say that uh, the opposition parties were able to go beyond one of the main fault lines that divide Turkish society. That is the fault line between the kind of like the secularist and the Islamist, if you will, to put it very kind of crudely. Um, now, the, the memorandum itself is mostly formalist, focusing on uh, repairing institutions um, uh, towards strengthening the parliament over the executive and building a rule, rule of law state. And of course, one needs to think of this emphasis against the backdrop of how the opposition parties see the presidential system as a system that the completely deteriorated rule of law and uh, deteriorated institutions and empowered the executive over legislative and the judiciary. So that's kind of like the context out of which this memorandum um, comes. Um, and at the same time, it also emphasizes, which I think is important for our discussion today, the commitment of the opposition's parties to the, Euro to the EU, but also the European institutions, such as the Council of Europe. So that's kind of like a, there's a strong emphasis in the statements of the opposition parties, but also in the memorandum about this commitment. Um, and I think it's kind of fair to interpret the memorandum as a signal by these six parties uh, to the voters, including the hesitant voters, um, their determination and um, kind of um, will to, uh, to repair what has been damaged in Turkey in the last um, couple of years. There has, however, been criticism uh, within the Turkish public or among the Turkish public mainly on the grounds that the Kurdish left-leaning HDP is missing from the opposition. Um, 
um, which, as I said earlier, is an important kingmaker in the Turkish elections. And that role of HDP has become even clearer during local elections in March um, 2019. Having said that, however, there are two parts of the memorandum that kind of like signal actually uh, positive or send positive, might, posit send, might posit send positive signals to the um, Kurdish voters as well. One is the emphasis on um, the um, rejection of the six opposition parties of the government appointed trustees in the municipalities. And that has been mainly the Kurdish municipalities that suffered from that in the last couple of years. So that is, an, I think, an important emphasis of the memorandum. And that is an important signal to the Kurdish voters. And the second is the uh, there is one sentence in the memorandum which mentions the 1921 constitution. Um, obviously, since it is just one sentence, it is really difficult to talk on uh, a factual basis uh, what it really implies. But there have also been interpretations that that might kind of like um, that might signal uh, to the Kurdish voters the willingness of the six opposition parties to build a pluralistic uh, kind of um, politics, if you will, if they come to power. Because 1921 constitution is known for its kind of like the pluralistic uh, character in the history of constitutions uh, or the, in the history of Turkish constitutions. Um, now, um, jumping ahead to the challenges ahead, I think one needs to adopt a little bit of a temporal uh, approach when, uh, while thinking about the possible challenges or stumbling blocks for the opposition. Now, um, I kind of um, prefer to think of it as in two phases. The first phase is the period until the elections, and the second phase is what happens if the opposition comes to power and that transitional phase transitional phase towards um, uh, forming a parliamentary democracy. Now, the period until the elections, uh, one of the questions, open questions still for me, is whether the opposition parties that form the nation's alliance will be able to stay, to get, stay together against the backdrop of uh, like rumors about certain tensions among them. And here, I think at play is are two factors. One is intra-party struggles, but also inter-party struggles. So bear in mind that um, the opposition parties stand together today with the aim to change the presidential system back to a strengthened version of parliamentary democracy. But in a parliamentary democracy, alliance politics is no longer going to be there, which basically means that these political parties, although they stand together, at the same time, they are also competing with one another simultaneously in kind of like um, um, um, preparing themselves towards that moment, uh, if that moment ever comes in the future. Now, the second challenge um, during the period until the elections would be to what extent the opposition parties um, um, be able to go beyond the formalistic steps and the formalistic emphasis on repairing institutions and explain to the voters how they plan to fix things beyond these formalistic steps, i.e. like the, the, deba the debate about issue areas, right? Economic crisis being one of them. So what does the opposition offer um, as an alternative to what the current government is doing, for instance, to fix Turkey's economic crisis and another uh, and other issue areas. Of course, one can here ask, like, uh, do they really need to do this? Would this be a good tactical move? Because the minute you start talking about the issue areas, that might also kind of like bring to the surface more the tensions that exist among these political parties. And here, one should, of course, emphasize um, the Kurdish issue as like the main stumbling block to the uh, opposition, um, uh, the six opposition parties. And there, I think one should really watch for the watch for how the election campaigns would unfold there and what would be the promises, actual promises or the hints um, uh, during the election campaigns. Now, um, the transition, if the opposition wins the election in uh, 2023. And of course, here one needs to emphasize it's not only about winning the presidential election, it is also about gaining the majority of the seats in the parliament, because without the majority of the seats in the parliament, uh, the system will not work. So it will get into a deadlock, in a different deadlock. Like if the president is basically coming from the opposition, but the parliament, the majority in the parliament still is, AK, is still AKP and MHB, that means a serious uh, deadlock in the system. So the 
the aim of the opposition is not only win the presidential election, but also get the majority in the parliament and majority in the parliament as well as 360 seats at least in order to be able to change the constitution. And that's not an easy task. And that kind of like, again, goes back to the kingmakers. Uh, so the kingmakers need to be uh, convinced. Um, um, and I, I just, as one comment about the challenges ahead, I totally agree with Özgür, uh, is that I think there are kind of like um, two um, important factors. One is, again, winning that election. Second, managing the transition well. And there, uh, I think the question about the president to come will be coming will be basically because it will still be the presidential system. So the president to come will have tremendous powers. So then there needs to be some guarantees or uh, checks and balances introduced into the system so that the president to be, if the election, if the opposition wins the election in 2023, doesn't actually uh, abuse those uh, tremendous powers. Um, and beyond that, um, because one can one can think about democracy in terms of repairing institutions, but it won't be, I think, in the medium to long term um, enough to kind of uh, constitute a more substantive democracy. And there, for instance, things that I personally would watch for is the um, uh, position of the opposition parties on different, for instance, on the Dianet or on the National Security Council, et cetera, et cetera. So things that would basically signal that the opposition parties actually uh, would like to go beyond just the mere reset of the system back to the parliamentary system. But again, that's a question for the more long term. Uh, and perhaps that's the question more for also Turkish citizens, not for the um, not for for for European and Western um, policymakers and experts. Now, um, just very quickly on the as as uh, closing remarks on the on the current um, um, situation in Ukraine and uh, Russia's uh, crisis with the West over European security order. So, what does it mean uh, for um, Turkey? I mean, the way I see it is I differ a little bit from uh, Özgür because I actually think that Turkey has been since the beginning of the of the invasion, Turkey has been trying to balance economy benefits, its economy benefits and costs. So not necessarily like try, trying a balancing act in a more geopolitical ideological sense between NATO and Russia, but more balancing its own economy benefits and costs between Ukraine and Russia. Özgür mentioned uh, Turkey has drones to Ukraine, but at the same time it has abstained from endorsing the EU sanctions regime so far. Uh, Turkey is dependent on Russian gas, Turkey, the tourism in revenues coming from Ukrainian and Russian tourists is an important income for Turkey. And one should basically think of this against the backdrop of a, a increasing the deteriorating economic crisis. So it's basically, I think what Turkey is trying to do is uh, trying to balance those economic benefits and costs. Having said that, as Özgür mentioned, uh, I think Turkey entered um, since the election of Biden into the White House. Uh, Turkey has been kind of stepping back away from its confrontational approach in foreign policy, which to me can be interpreted as an indication that Turkey actually has had already reached the limits in its balancing act between the West and Russia before even these, this crisis erupted. But now with the with with, the, uh, with Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine on the table, I think soon uh, the country might be heading to a point where it needs to make a clear choice about um, where it stands. Um, and there, I think for the that's kind of like a more short term um, um, issue. But for the midterm and the long term, um, post 20. 4th of February is nothing going to be like the pre 24th of February. And we talked about this before, uh, Tony, before we started the, the webinar. And I don't think we can really think about post 24th of February with the parameters of the 20, pre 24th of February. That means that there is going to be, um, and there is already uh, talk about it, uh, a, a, a different European security order. 
Uh, and within that context, I think that has different dimensions. Of course, it has the dimension of, I think, the militarization of foreign policy, for instance, how to think about NATO, how to think about concepts like European strategic autonomy, European strategic sovereignty. And in addition to that, of course, the very issue of green transformation. So obviously, all of these questions that uh, are discussed within European circles today, um, given Turkey's put everything aside, geographical proximity to Europe, I think um, that kind of like provides an opportunity, the current moment provides an opportunity to rethink EU-Turkey relations, taking into account all these different aspects. But my feeling is that in the coming um, um, period, we will have a more pronounced discussion on the security aspect and the energy aspect of the relationship in the EU-Turkey relations, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sinem. I think this was very well uh, constructed um, presentation regarding the also the opportunities for the opposition alliance, but also the challenges, um, and also what you can expect from the opposition alliance. Um, I will now raise uh, some of the issues that I think are problematic or or that's something that I would like you to to elaborate a little bit more. I, I try to pick up some of the key issues. Um, I start with some of the things that um, Özgür mentioned. Um, uh, the way I see it is that had not uh, the Russia invaded Ukraine, I would have uh, said that uh, your uh, view regarding uh, Turkey's balancing and uh, Erdogan's um, future options would have been overtly positive, maybe. But uh, uh, now things have definitely changed. However, I was also thinking about uh, the balancing issue, um, agreeing with uh, Sinem in the in the sense that Turkey has not participated in the sanctions, probably will not. Although there might be quite uh, heavy pressure coming from the American, from the U.S. Uh, side in the coming weeks, we also see this regarding some of the some of the other allies such as Israel and Arab Emirates. Uh, there, there is also this question of uh, Turkey's air, airspace that other countries have, have now shut and Turkey has not. Um, and then this uh, very delicate way of formulating the Montreal uh, Convention declaration, basically uh, giving the impression that it uh, now applies not only the, the Black Sea countries, but also others. So that would imply also NATO countries. Um, but what it's what I think is more crucial is is that we have had a decade now uh, uh, on a weekly basis uh, comments coming from either directly from president or for or from his closest circles, uh, emphasizing that. Uh, what I think is a, some sort of revisionist stance on on uh, on behalf of Turkey. Um, there has there has been so much uh, talk and and, and statements uh, indicating that Turkey is also somehow very uh, should we say uh, disappointed regarding the post Cold War uh, arrangements. Um, there is this talk has been about a post-Western world uh, constant blaming that uh, Turkey should have a much bigger role in world politics. Uh, Erdogan always saying, uh, "Dunya, question, do you 
referring to the United Nations Security Council, saying that uh, the world is bigger than five. Um, so I was just wondering that whether all this stuff uh, should we expect that Turkey just get is getting rid of this? Uh, because the way I see it is that we have basically we have basically now uh, painted a picture of Turkey that existed, let's say, from 1999 to somewhere around nine, uh, 2008. Um, and after that, we have seen this kind of very revisionist uh, uh, discourse coming from Turkey. So the main main question here is that uh, should we expect that Erdogan is now uh, quitting with all this stuff and that uh, and that these structural issues and these recent issues are actually forcing him uh, to get rid of all this. So that that's the main main issue regarding regarding the the big picture of Turkey's foreign policy. And then the related question to that is that uh, if there would be an opposition president and also a parliament and and Turkey would uh, be uh, uh, and they would they would then compose Turkey's foreign policy. Uh, what issues would be the same? And I, I definitely agree with Özgür that that some of the issues would then remain. The issue, uh, the Turkish position regarding the Eastern Mediterranean and Cyprus is definitely one of them. Uh, uh, before the invasion, it would also be the good relationship with Russia. And then there is, of course, the perennial question regarding the PKK, and that relates uh, very much to the to Turkey's position in Syria as well. What we would get rid of, say, with the Kilis Sharolu presidency, uh, is the uh, support for the Muslim Brotherhood, and um, also I think that uh, there would be a re-evaluation of Turkey's position in Idlib, in Syria, and with these very uh, problematic proxies, that's, uh, some of which are, are hardcore Islamists and even jihadists. Uh, so I would think this, this would be different. Um, and the question, of course, is that if uh, if uh, if President Erdogan is able to to continue, what will happen to these issues? Uh, so this this is uh, the the one point of the of the issue. Uh, then we have another issue regarding the the domestic opposition. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, Western comments and also Turkish comments regarding the. Uh, regarding the the candidate issue, uh, it's, uh, it's it's now been more or less clear, I guess, that Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu will be the the Nations Alliance candidate. Is do you think this is uh, de facto already decided? Because uh, some of the statements are are not that clear, and whether Meral Akşener will would then be the the prime minister in the positive scenario. Uh, the the issue with this has been that. Uh, that Kilis Jarolu seems to be uh, a little bit, uh, should we say, not that popular among some sections of society, and that uh, the the two majors who who actually succeeded in 2019, uh, Mansur Yavas and, and Ekrem Imamoglu, are more popular figures. This this is one. Uh, uh, one comment that I, I have constantly seen that maybe one of these should be the presidential candidate for the opposition. Um, then there is uh, the third question, which relates to the uh, to the Kurdish uh, constituency. Uh, of course, that is roughly said divided. In, in two parts, the conservative Kurds, what, who will they vote, whether they will still back uh, the Jumhur Ittifaki, the Republican Alliance, uh, Alliance and, and Erdogan. Uh, has there been changes in this constituency? And then the leftist Kurdish constituency, the, or the liberal leftist, or, or how you define it. Uh, Sinem already talked about it, that whether the Nations Alliance is able to to seduce, so to say, this uh, this group, um, 
what I'm a little bit afraid of is that now that uh, uh, there is this um, uh, Milie G. Harget part to see in, in Erdogan's uh, club, and then we have Merrill Actioners, strongly national party in the in the other alliance, that whether the Kurdish votes will just be split between the two, uh, uh, or or what will happen in in in, in that. Uh, dimension. Mm. I don't know if the if there has been any official statement from the HDP, the Kurdish party's part, that uh, whether they are, what are they going to do, uh, and uh, and then there is also the question of we just see that Kemal Kilisharol was participating in the Soviet party event. Uh, with uh, the uh, Davutol and, and Karamal uh, applauding him, this might be a little bit tricky question to the hardcore uh, Republican People's Party voters, uh, the secularist core of the JHP. Uh, so how they feel about it, that, that is also one issue. But um, let me now proceed the way that uh, I will give Özgür a um, chance to comment on this, and I would basically most of all like to hear that uh, your view on the first part of my question pattern regarding that whether Erdogan has skipped all this Muslim Brotherhood thing and uh, and uh, post Western world stuff regarding the <laughs> regarding the Turkish foreign policy. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Tony. Before before starting, maybe I can make a disclaimer. There is a problem with my screen uh, from the beginning of the meeting, uh, so I'm actually looking into a void uh, when I'm speaking, and it does feel a little bit peculiar. So I just wanted to share this with you. Uh, so Tony, you have so many questions, uh, some of which I can answer, uh, some of which I cannot. Uh, the ones on domestic politics, first of all, uh, who would be the candidate of the opposition party? That's a uh, million dollar uh, question, uh, obviously. It is apparent uh, that Mr. Kushtarol uh, is presenting himself uh, as a possible candidate. Uh, and he has also uh, said that the two mayors whom you said are very popular in the society, that's also my observation, uh, should continue uh, their jobs as uh, mayors. Uh, so, left to him, uh, probably Kılıçdaroğlu uh, would like to be president himself. But then, of course, there are so many factors uh, that will uh, influence the outcome of this question. First of all, uh, popularity uh, among the voters uh, is one of the things. And then, suitability uh, in terms of the individual strategies uh, of all leaders uh, in the alliance uh, is another factor. And then, of course, capacity to govern uh, is one factor. Or being able to put together uh, a good council of ministers. Or like having support in the bureaucracy. Uh, so I believe that all of these factors uh, will be at play. Uh, and the decision of who the joint candidate of the opposition will be, uh, will not be easy. Uh, that will be a difficult question. Uh, and I think that, that with more than a year, uh, to the scheduled elections, it's actually too early uh, to predict who that person will be uh, with any degree of uh, certainty. Uh, regarding conservative votes, who they would, conservative Kurds and uh, who they would vote for, or uh, how the Kurdish party uh, would act, uh, first of all, these conservative Kurdish uh, voters are generally right wing. So they traditionally uh, used to vote for right-wing parties, and usually they would vote for the right-wing party that is in government, uh, and that has been the AK party uh, for over a decade now. Uh, but now, uh, with the AK party aligning itself with the far-right uh, nationalist action party, uh, and you know taking strong stances vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Kurdish problem, uh, those voters seem to be in a way unrepresented, like they don't want to vote for the AK party perhaps. Uh, they are Kurds, but 
HPP is their political other, at least uh, for some of them. That's why it's their uh, separate uh, voting block, but they're also conservative. Uh, so voting for uh, CHP is not easy either. Uh, and then there are these new uh, breakaway parties from the AK party whom they could vote for, uh, but their potential uh, is questionable. Uh, so I don't think that any bloc or any party uh, should take them uh, for granted. Uh, I believe that when, they, when we see uh, undecided, don't know, don't want to vote, uh, a considerable part of those uh, could be the uh, conservative curse. Now, regarding how uh, the HDP, the Kurdish party, uh, would act, I mean, look, their party could be banned uh, before the election. And if their party is banned, I doubt that they would say, uh, Mr. President, we are grateful to you for banning our party, so we will vote for you. Uh, I don't think that will happen. Uh, I think that they are highly inclined uh, to vote for whoever uh, the opposition candidate is, so long as that person uh, is not someone uh, very uh, controversial uh, for them. So long as that person is someone uh, who is acceptable, uh, I think uh, they, soon, uh, they will vote for. Now, on foreign policy, I will actually insist uh, that we won't see very big changes on any issue. Uh, first of all, like Tony, you have mentioned Turkey and President Erdogan's complaints uh, about the representation crisis uh, in global governance. I think that a new Turkish government uh, would have similar views, but they would use different if they would use a different terminology, perhaps, uh, to manifest uh, their uh, frustration uh, with global governance, or they may or may not give priority uh, to that issue, uh, depending on where they see uh, Turkey's national interest. Now, there is the question of strategic autonomy. Uh, so. Under the AK party government, uh, Turkey has actually, you know, Turkish officials have mentioned uh, Turkey's desire uh, for strategic autonomy, but I don't think that this is something specific to the AK party either. Uh, I think that any Turkish government uh, would desire uh, a level of strategic autonomy for Turkey. Uh, of course, governments before the AK party, and particularly those during the Cold War, uh, did not have an opportunity uh, to experiment uh, with strategic autonomy. Uh, but the AK party uh, experimented with this. And in order to attain strategic autonomy uh, for Turkey, creating a balance uh, with, between great powers uh, was the strategy uh, that the AK party uh, tried, uh, which didn't work, uh, not because of the AK party or President Erdogan, but because of Russia has been behaving. Russia is no longer uh, an actor that a country uh, like Turkey can affiliate with. Uh, but I believe that a new Turkish government uh, would also like options, uh, so would not like to uh, be monopolized. So they would also try to diversify uh, Turkey's uh, network of relationships and perhaps alliances. Uh, but the thing is, I believe they would be able to do this in a way, they would be able to frame this in a way that does not, that does not contradict with or conflict with uh, Turkey's uh, NATO alliance, or like also we could talk about Turkey desiring a bigger footprint uh, in its neighborhood. Uh, I believe this actually started uh, before President Erdogan, uh, late Ismail Cem, uh, who was uh, you know a, a center-left figure, a social actually a European-style uh, social democrat, uh, was the first foreign minister to experiment uh, with zero problems with neighbors and uh, reintegrating Turkey uh, to its neighborhood. As a matter of fact, Ismail Cem also uh, was a believer uh, in Turkey having good relations uh, with Eurasia uh, as well as uh, with the West, but he did not see uh, Turkey's relationship with Eurasian countries uh, as a contradiction back then, of course, during the 1990s, because uh, back then, we were talking about uh, the, the NATO-Russia founding act. Uh, the relations between uh, Russia and NATO uh, was uh, much better. But a lot of what President Erdogan has later tried to do was experimented with uh, before him as well. Now, so on issues like Cyprus, uh, let's say, seen as a national issue in Turkey, uh, 
uh, as well as in Greek Cyprus, or perhaps also in Greece, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, it's, it's a national issue uh, in Turkey. Or uh, Turkey, let's say, being concerned about the new Kurdish state uh, in, with proximity to its borders. Uh, this would be a problem uh, for any Turkish government, and any Turkish government uh, would try to prevent this from happening if it's within their uh, reach. Or let's say Turkey's uh, operation in Libya. Now, under a different setting, perhaps Turkey would not need a military operation uh, to have an impact in Libya. Uh, but as a matter of fact, it also fits into the uh, general framework of Turkey wanting a bigger say in developments uh, in its uh, region. And by the way, uh, speaking of Libya, uh, sorry if I deviate uh, from the subject just a little bit, but I cannot help myself say this. Uh, when Turkey conducted its operation uh, in Libya, it was criticized uh, for undermining uh, NATO interests. As a matter of fact, if Turkey had not intervened, Haftar, supported by Russia, protected by Wagner, uh, would have captured uh, Western Libya. And as Russia is now invading Ukrainian territory, they could be keeping the, holding the gateway from Africa uh, to Europe via their puppet. So this is what actually Turkey prevented uh, in Libya. So on some of these issues, or let's say we have, been, we have talked about uh, Turkey's relationships with Syria, uh, but perhaps this should be seen as Turkey, and actually Turkey should perhaps be supported in this, uh, creating costs for Russia in Syria. This is exactly what Turkey uh, is doing in Libya. So some of the issues uh, where Turkey has been criticized in the past, perhaps for not coordinating uh, with its allies, and you know, there is that. If Turkey wants to be supported, it should also uh, coordinate uh, with the allies. But we may need to rethink uh, in the uh, new period ahead. Now, sanctions uh, is a complicated issue for Turkey. First of all, uh, Turkey generally uh, does not believe in sanctions. Turkey doesn't believe uh, they work, and Turkey believes it hurts others as well. And there is, a, there is a history of this in Turkey's case. Like the sanctions against Saddam Hussein, yes, they targeted Saddam's Iraq and hurt Saddam's Iraq. But the second country to be hurt economically was Turkey. The sanctions against Iran, targeted Iran, did hurt Iran, but then Turkey was also hurt considerably. Uh, so already, although Turkey is not joining either the U.S. sanctions or uh, the EU sanctions, the U.S. and EU sanctions against Russia will hurt the Turkish economy as well. And as a matter of fact, of course, like everyone else, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, is also hurting Turkey. Russian tourists are important for Turkey. So are Ukrainian tourists. Well, Turkish agricultural exports to, uh, to Russia are very important, but so are Turkey's agriculture imports from both uh, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, as in the case of other European countries, Turkey is also highly dependent on, on Russia, on energy. But the problem is, Turkey is going, going through a bottleneck. So it is not as easy uh, for Turkey uh, to impose sanctions on Russia. I mean, it's not easy for anyone, by the way, don't get me wrong. But it might be just a little bit more difficult uh, for Turkey. And regarding Turkey joining EU sanctions, uh, there's a very important point here. Before the European Union actually came up with this package of sanctions, all EU member states had a chance uh, to provide input into this. There were lengthy discussions on uh, what this package uh, would exactly look like. And Turkey had no say in any of this. So Turkey is not an EU member state. So for Turkey, it's not as easy uh, as EU member states to abide by whatever position uh, the EU takes, because the EU member states have a say in that position, and Turkey does not, and there is no mechanism uh, for Turkey to be uh, consulted with. Perhaps, you know, this is one issue uh, where we should uh, think about uh, in the future. How can uh, Turkey be consulted with uh, before uh, these foreign policy decisions are taken, uh, so that there's a better chance uh, Turkey can uh, comply with them. Uh, so also about, you know, Turkey's balancing or counterbalancing uh, in the case of uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis. This is a conflict uh, that Turkey did not desire at all. Turkey wanted 
particularly President Erdogan, wanted to continue good relations with Russia. And that Turkey cannot continue those good relations with Russia uh, is not a good thing for Turkey. So, yes, Turkey was actually quite hesitant uh, in terms of picking sides uh, in this crisis. But left to Turkey, if, you know, if Turkey had a choice, it would like to have good relations uh, with Russia and Ukraine. But the moment this has not become possible any longer, Turkey actually picked sides. I mean, Ukraine is thanking Turkey for, for its support. Russia is criticizing Turkey for its support to Ukraine. So I think that, you know, uh, this explains what uh, Turkey's position is. Uh, and also, you know, that, you know, let's take the case of Montreux. It's not only, so Turkey's main only concern cannot be the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Turkey also, for example, wants to protect the Montreux Treaty, Montreux Convention, in the long run. So Turkey cannot take any steps which would lead Russia to unilaterally withdraw from the convention, uh, for example. So is there a balance there? Yes, Turkey needs to be very balanced there as well. And for this reason, uh, Turkey is doing its best uh, to protect Montreux as well as uh, make it work. Uh, but let me say that Turkey is progressively, if not perhaps as fast as would be desired uh, by its allies, uh, Turkey is progressively pivoting away from Russia, not because it desires so, uh, but because of uh, Russia's own behavior. Uh, and I think that this will continue under the Erdogan administration. And if there is a new administration, under the new administration as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zesker. I think this very well wrapped up uh, and synthesized the, what I would say the mainstream view from Ankara analysts regarding Turkey's stance, because this is pretty much what I have uh, I have witnessed from other Turkish analysts as well. And, and in, in that sense, also it's important because it synthesizes the the view from Ankara. Um, before I give floor to Sinem to react, I would like you both to uh, uh, think about one more issue. Um, this is about uh, back again to the domestic sphere, and the issue is so-called manufacturing crisis. Um, I'm not the only one who who thought that in the previous cases, also in terms of 2019 uh, municipal elections and also the previous action, uh, elections and, and whenever there was a, uh, a prospective of, of Erdogan losing his rule, he somehow uh, manufactured either a domestic crisis or, or international uh, PKK related crisis or, or something like that. So I, I think we should keep in mind that if things start to look very bad for Erdogan uh, in the upcoming months, uh, I think there is a there is a risk that something like this might happen. And, and this is also one of the issues why why people, uh, why the analysts in the West have been quite worried about what will happen with the next elections and whether this will be a, a crucial threshold for for Turkish democracy, uh, but now I give Sinem uh, you a chance to comment any of these issues, uh, whatever you think is is relevant here. Um, thank you, Tony. Just very uh, quick um, about the, the your point on or question on whether um, this post West thinking in Ankara is now gone. Um, I would say that it's still early to say with 100% security, but what we can say with what we know at the moment is that um, two factors. First is uh, that in a way um, the appearance of Russian uh, misstrategic calculation on the one hand um, and thus uh, Russia as days go by it looks like the Russia might be uh, the likelihood for Russia to be on the losing side of this 
is higher and higher. So that's one factor. The second factor is that the very rapid, uh, even though belated, but rapid unity uh, that emerged within the EU to get in coordination with the US, I think those take those two factors taken together are likely to um, push Ankara to rethink that assumption that the West is in decline. And I don't think it's only Ankara. I think it's a lot of different actors uh, in the region uh, which might have tried to uh, play similar um, um, tactics. So I think that we probably have entered, uh, at least judging by the short term, we probably entered into an era where that assumption will no longer hold. Um, but I don't think we know enough at the moment to say with 100% certainty that whether the weakening of that assumption will lead to a kind of like a Western dominance in international relations, that I'm not sure, that I think we still need to see how things are going to unfold. Uh, it's a little bit too early to say. And uh, related to this about the uh, revisionism and so on, I think uh, what I said in my presentation, like, I don't have an answer, but I personally think that since things are changing so fast, uh, we can't really use the concepts and parameters of the pre-24 February world to understand what is yet to come. Uh, because I think a lot of actors are now moving, looking at each other and see how uh, other actors are positioning themselves and thinking of their own position concerning that. Um, but that means, I think, for both the EU and Turkey, there is one question at the table that both parties, I think, need to honestly answer. Like in a new European security order, how do they see one another? And how do they would like to like uh, rethink of their relationship towards building a new European security order? Um, and that requires, I think, first, first and foremost, repairing the trust that has been eroded in the last uh, years. And second, I think it is equally important to acknowledge the agency of one another as equals. Um, so that also, I think, has been a, a problem uh, for both parties, not only for Turkey, but I think also for the EU. Um, regarding the, the opposition and foreign policy, if opposition comes to power, I mean, I agree with uh, Özgür that when it comes to certain threat perceptions, uh, they are beyond political parties. Uh, for instance, Cyprus, uh, Aegean Islands, uh, the Kurdish question. So there won't be a very significant deviation from the existing threat perceptions. That being said, I think there might be a difference in terms of the methods that are used to tackle or to kind of like a, a design strategies a, against the backdrop of these threat perceptions. Um, the, the candidate of the, domestic, the opposition, I don't know. <laughs> I think, and I totally agree with Özgür, I think it's uh, too, the, clearly um, Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu um, uh, has that desire, but so do uh, Mr. İmamoğlu, for instance. Uh, so it's, I think it's up in the air and we will probably know in the coming months uh, closer to the end of the year, I would say, uh, there will be uh, clearer signals in terms of which direction this is going. About the HTP, there is actually, which I forgot to mention in my presentation, in addition to the Nations Alliance, there is also another opposition alliance, Democracy Alliance, that is composed of uh, based Turkey's left pink political parties together with the HTP. Uh, and I personally think that this is, a, as it is, it is good uh, if you look at it from the perspective of a democracy, because the more different voices you have, it's better. I mean, having a, like a comprehensive alliance is of course good, but then the risk of having one comprehensive alliance is to basically kind of having different opinions to be silence, if you will, not necessarily by force, but uh, because as a tactical issue. So in that sense, I think having a third alliance is important, but the question on the table is that who this third alliance would support during the elections. And that is a matter I think we will, um, I, I personally think that um, from a rational perspective, obviously uh, 
it is too risky of a move if the election goes into the second round because the third alliance doesn't support the candidate of the second, like the democratic alliance, the leftist alliance doesn't support the um, candidate of the nation's alliance. But as it is right now, again, we don't have enough facts on the ground to know which direction it will go. It is something to watch for. Um, and then the manufacturing crisis, uh, I think that is a concern for a lot of people in Turkey as well. And there has been a lot of talk about it, particularly uh, also in terms of foreign policy, whether there will be another invasion in Syria or something about Cyprus. But the thing is, what is happening uh, in Ukraine right now, I think makes that kind of moves very difficult. <laughs> Uh, so if there is going to be a crisis, I don't think it will be foreign policy related. Uh, I'm not saying that there will be a crisis, but if there were, there is going to be one that if there were one that that might be in the domestic realm, not necessarily in the foreign policy realm. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Do you could have something to add regarding the manufacturing, the crisis? Because uh, I, I think there is the tradition in Turkey as well, and it's not uh, something unique in that sense that when there is a heightened international situation um, and perhaps some um, fears and, and unpredictable issues that uh, the, the general audience wants to see a, a strong leader. And I, I have already seen in the pro-government circles um, these kind of uh, arguments that uh, now more than ever again we need uh, we need the race character the strong leader in Turkey. So how how do you feel about this? I I totally agree with Sinan. I mean, what we are mentioning is of course a national emergency uh, that would create a rally around the flag moment, and in Turkey the rally around the flag moments are really strong. Uh, but the problem is there is no room in Turkey in the right now uh, for an additional crisis. And we're going, we're still, I mean, like, we sometimes overlook this, but we are still going through a pandemic. Then there is the economic crisis in Turkey. Then there is a major uh, regional security crisis. There is actually a tectonic shift geopolitically. Uh, so if there was an additional crisis in Turkey, uh, that could have, you know, major impact on the already very fragile Turkish economy. So I hope that such a thing doesn't happen. I don't think it will. Good, good to know because this has been, uh, at least in in the past months, uh, one of the issues that has been highly discussed uh, regarding the, the coming elections. Uh, but there's a re related question to this as well, that we know that there are some of these groups, uh, especially since the, the failed coup at attempt um, in the night uh, from, from that onwards, uh, we re remember that Erdogan was, was uh, calling his um, supporters to uh, to back the, the the government, but that that's, this has then transformed into into more problematic idea of of um, street patrols and and and uh, neighborhood guard, guards and uh, and do we know anything about the current situation? Because at some point it seemed that these are developing some sort of paramilitary forces that come to the streets if if the if the if the Erdogan's government is somehow threatened. Um, what do you think about these kind of situations? Is is there a risk that we we will see something like this in? In, in the upcoming months, especially if things start to look bad for the government. Oskar, do you have a view on this? Yeah, I mean, there was uh, that kind, I mean, that kind of an uh, vigilance culture uh, did emerge in the after of uh, the failed court attempt. Uh, we did see some examples of it uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, lynch attempts uh, against refugees, or, for example, last summer, uh, when there were the forest fires, 
citizens getting organized and checking for IDs uh, in their uh, provinces, towns, or uh, districts uh, to see if there's anyone from outside of the district. And particularly based on the rumors uh, that the PKK was starting those fires, if there was uh, anyone uh, from the southeast. And then, of course, there were you know random incidences uh, where certain political figures or journalists, etc., uh, were attacked by mobs uh, in Turkey. We have seen uh, some examples, uh, but I can say that as a general rule uh, in Turkey. The wider Turkish public uh, actually uh, is very stability conscious. So the moment uh, Turkey's stability uh, is threatened, whoever uh, is threatening Turkey's stability will be punished uh, politically. And also the government in Turkey is very jealous. The state apparatus uh, in Turkey is also very jealous uh, about its authority. Uh, so I think that there is a limit uh, to which uh, such a uh, vigilance culture uh, can prosper in Turkey. Do you agree, Zinem, on this? Do, do you think there is a risk for this kind of action? Um, I mean, since we are speaking in the realm of the speculation, that might be uh, against the backdrop of a couple of, I think, um, factors. One is that if you look at the public realm, I think, um, especially um, within uh, the the, the the the the ruling alliance uh, circles um my observation is that uh, the voices of the far right and far left are the loudest and that's of obviously an extreme position um second is um if you look at it from the perspective of the president and the, his uh, ruling party and also the uh, the junior partner MHP, I think for them the costs of departure, leaving office, are much higher than costs of uh, staying um, by using suppressive means. Um, third is violence as a means to continue maintaining power is theoretically of course a possibility. Uh, and if you take all of them together, I cannot, as a fact, or with 100% certainty, say that it is not a possibility. It might be a possibility. But then I think that kind of like brings us to what Özgür was saying. So there are like, uh, I think, three factors here to take into account. First is uh, the perception of Turkish society, mainstream society in general, about uh, that kind of violence uh, might prevent it. And more importantly, I would say that uh, the position of the security apparatus Will there be the defining uh, factor if we come to such a moment? Uh, the outcome of that moment will be, I think, primarily uh, shaped by the attitudes within the security apparatus. And there, I mean, obviously it's difficult to know, but um, given against the backdrop of an increasingly uh, powerful opposition, at least at the discursive level and at the more performative level, uh, I have a feeling that the uh, kind of the balance might be tilted against within the security apparatus. Like uh, if that uh, such a moment comes, uh, then the the outcome uh, might be that the security apparatus actually might kind of be uh, the one of the preventing actors of that. So it's at the end of the day, it's a matter of like the the actors who have the means of violence, <laughs> you know. Uh, what, do, what they do, how they position themselves vis-a-vis -vis one another and so on. Very well, good. Uh, I ask this because there was at some point at least uh, some indications that for the Erdogan supporters, uh, the government, uh, government it's some sort of an existential question that they are afraid of that the, what they see is, is the the oppressive secularist re regime or something like that is coming back. So, so this this is one of the one of the issues here. But yeah, now we are running out of time. I'm very much thanking you, uh, Özgür and Sinem, for this very, I would I would say, very informative and useful uh, view, views regarding what's what to expect from Turkey and and what to expect in Turkey's domestic politics. I also think uh, we managed to include the new situation uh, a very this kind of structural change regarding the how the international system will develop uh, 
And I also definitely agree that uh, now there is a heightened need for uh, Turkey and European Union to uh, somehow rebuild the trust. That's the first step. Uh, then uh, look uh, more to the issues that uh, need to be strengthened in terms of cooperation. Uh, and of course, what will happen in Russia will will affect this um, in the coming months also. Uh, and um, I, I guess that the US uh, view on this is also uh, developing, uh, but there might also be some some pressure on, on Turkey and also on, on the EU in these issues. Um, it's been a very uh, uh, disastrous moment for a country like Finland as well. So we are definitely uh, in a in a state of, of rethinking many of the issues. Um, and uh, the NATO uh, membership is, is hotly debated in Finland at the moment. That, that I can assure you. Um, yeah, with these words and with the, with the hope, uh, hopeful uh, view that uh, when Turkey uh, reaches to the day of, of elections, everything goes smoothly and there is a genuine possibility for the opposition to compete. And even more to that, that all things will be peaceful at, at that time. Thank you very much, Özgür, Sinem, and the audience. Um, Thank you. We, Thank you, Tony. Thank you, and have a good day, and, and stay safe all.